This is a presentation from the Wapanka Historical Society.
So when I reached college, I became a history major and started doing research on the chain's history in depth. When we were out there on vacation, I would go to the historical society and the library and read books. And then um, by the time it was my senior year, I had to write, pick a topic, historical topic to write a thesis about. And so I chose the Chino Lakes. And really, in my thesis, I looked very specifically at how, basically I answered the question, why did the Chain of Lakes become a tourist destination? Uh, and that was really what my thesis was about. Um, and so I did that, that was back in 2014. And then uh, about five years later, I decided that I wanted, I wanted to sit down and write a book about the Chain of Lakes. So there have been a couple different history books about the Chain of Lakes. Uh, all of them are great. Uh, Jim Stern's book, Structured Waters, The Concise Guide to the Chain of Lakes, uh, Our Cottages and Memories. Um, and so I kind of looked at all these books, and I really wanted to have a different perspective on the Chain of Lakes. Um, a lot of the books on the chains focus on, um, they take the Chain of Lakes history by a lake by lake basis and go through it that way. Um, but I wanted to focus more, uh, kind of, I wanted to take a more chronological approach, look at how the chain has changed over time. Uh, so I made a couple deci other decisions on kind of how I wanted the book to be and uh, what I wanted to focus on. So um, I decided to publish the book through Arcadia Publishing. Um, Arcadia's Images of America series is very focused on images, historical images. And so I, the book was going to be image driven to meet their standards. And some of the Arcadia books um, uh, in the Images of America series, they, some of them tend to just be picture books with captions, but I really wanted to tell more of a story with mine, and so that really um, guided the text that's all in the book and what pictures I chose. Um, and then, as in my thesis, I also wanted to focus on the James tourism industry. So tourism encompasses a lot of different things related to vacationing and travel. Um, so I wanted to look at the activities tourists at the Chain of Lakes engaged in while staying there. Uh, the businesses and attractions they visited, where they stayed, and uh, how they traveled there. And then also the local people who started businesses and operated them for the tourists and also the locals as well. Uh, so Arcadia accepted my application to write the book in October 2018. And then over the next eight months or so, um, I took weekends uh, trips up here to the Chain of Lakes. I went to the Historical Society. Um, I scanned photos there, also did research. Um, and then the book came about, um, I finished the book by about August 2019, and then the book came out in um, 2020. Um, it was supposed to come out in um, April 2020, but some things happened, so the book date got pushed into June. Um, and I was very happy to still have it out. Um, I really, I just want to also just thank the Historical Society so much. They have been so supportive of the project. They let me go into their archives and scan photos. They have um, helped me in so many other different ways. And also wanted to thank the sponsors of this event tonight as well. So now I'm going to shift more into the history of the Chain of Lakes um, and the tourism industry that grew there. So I wanted to start with the photograph that is the cover of the book. Uh, so this photograph, it dates to about the early 1900s, and it shows um, Roy Holly and some of his friends on a canoe on Beasley Lake, so kind of by Bob Lake. And so um, this photo is just great. It was a perfect cover image. Um, I just love it because it kind of shows you how the fashion has changed. Like, I could not imagine today wearing all those like long sleeve clothes and pants while on a canoe in the hot sun. Um, but yeah, and really, before the days of speedboats, tourists um, took to the lakes um, on canoes. And they just, they often explored all the lakes in one day. It was a very different experience uh, without the speedboats of uh, today's era. And, um, lost my train of thought there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so um, kind of going 
more. Oh, and then also, um, the images that are in my book come from a lot of different sources. So I primarily use the Wapaka Historical Society's collection, but I also use some other archives <coughs> in the Midwest for specific things, or for specific topics, and also met with local people in their postcard collections and photo collections and uh, their family history as well. So I divided up the presentation into sections, which are uh, correlate with uh, the chapters of my book. Um, I'm not going to talk about every image in the book, but kind of just pick a selection uh, from each section. Um, so it uh, started with uh, the Chains early history. So it's a bit difficult to talk about the Chains early history in a book that's centered around images and photographs, um, mainly because the camera wasn't invented until the mid uh, 19th century, and even then, photo uh, cameras weren't really commonly owned and used until the late 19th century. So I had to be a bit more creative in picking the finding and picking the images for this section. Uh, so this is a hydro hydrological map of the chain of lakes. Um, basically, this means it shows the depths of the water. Um, you've probably seen a lot of these similar maps. I know a lot of the tourist decorations and things like that have it on there. Um, but so, really, the reason that people have come to the Chain of Lakes for um, really the four um, European Americans and the Native Americans um, was really because of the Chain of Lakes natural beauty. And that comes because um, about 10,000 years ago or so, um, the Laurentian ice sheet, which covered most of North America, started to retreat northward. And what happened is pieces of the ice fell off of the glacier and landed into this uh, plains that became. Wapaka County, and then as the glacier melted, the water was filled with rocks and soil, and that kind of carved all the different um, channels and uh, shorelines of the chain lakes as well. Um, this process also unearthed the chain's natural springs, um, that keep the water so clear. Um, and so, yeah, this the chain lakes um, natural beauty attracted people, and the first group of people who settled there um, were actually a Native American, or Native Americans um, before um, Columbus discovered um, North America, uh, was a Native American group that archaeologists called the Mound Builders. So the Mound Builders, um, we mostly, well, we, most information we know about them comes from archaeologists and the things they left behind. Um, so the Mound Builders actually built about 75 mounds, um, just kind of mounds of dirt on the chain of lakes. Uh, they use them for different purposes. Um, archaeologists believe um, they use some of them to bury their dead, but also use them for spiritual purposes as well. Um, and some of the mounds were actually built um, to resemble animals and uh, certain things, whether it was uh, uh, the animals that the Native Americans kind of revered or worshipped, um, or things like that. And so there's actually, on um, by Taylor Lake, there is a mound that's shaped like a catfish. Um, and so that mound is one of the few that has survived to the present day. And this postcard shows um, the, a plaque that the Wapaka Monday Night Club put on the mound to commemorate it in 1915. Um, and you can actually still see it today while driving along um, County Highway QQ. Um, so most of the mounds were destroyed around the turn of the century as people built buildings and farm land. Um, but archaeologists did uh, come in and they were able to document a lot of the locations um, of the mounds around the lake. So by the time Euro European Americans started coming to the Chain of Lakes in the 19th century, uh, the, Menom the Menominee tribe was the dominant Native American tribe on the lakes. The Menominee bands hunted, camped, and fished on the lake shores. Uh, they had a more permanent settlement by Otter Lake, um, where they grew corn. Um, and so this photograph uh, shows an example of kind of the types of canoes that the Menominee would use um, to traverse the lakes. Um, this picture actually shows um, Louise Ashman, who's a relative of the writer Margaret Ashman. Um, and she's posing in this canoe on Long Lake, and uh, her brother actually purchased this canoe from Native Americans in northern Wisconsin. But it's a good example of what they would have used. So the Chain of Lakes Menominee Band uh, was led by, um, I'm going to butcher this, but it's Niata Wapomi. Um, 
So this is an illustration of him that was done by um, an, art, an anthropologist who did, wrote a book on the Menominee in the late 19th century. Um, and he was actually the he was actually kind of the second chief of the entire uh, tribe. Uh, chief Oshkosh, who Oshkosh named after, was the main leader, but he uh, oversaw the band that was in uh, the Chato Lakes. And so, uh, as with the rest of the Menominee, uh, after they ceded their lands to the U.S., uh, they were moved to a reservation near Shawano in the 1850s. Um, and a one uh, kind of benefit of the Menominee having the reservation still in Wisconsin was that anthropologists were able to go and interview them um, before they passed away. So they're able to document a lot of the chains in Native American history uh, before um, they died out. So kind of um, moving on to the next period. Um, so European Americans began to settle on the chain in 1850. Um, but they didn't immediately see the Chain of Lakes as a place to have fun or to, have, or to uh, do recreation activities on. And this was because they were too busy focusing on farming to survive and to make it on the frontier. Um, and actually one thing that even kind of shows um, what the settlers were looking for is that the first settlers um, who came to Apaca in 1949, the Vermonters, they actually decided to, they chose Wapaka as their site because it was by the river and it had um, the waterfalls there. And so that was, they needed that to power mills to grind their crops. So that was really what they were focusing on. They, the Chino Lakes kind of fell into the background um, for that time period. And then it wasn't until the 1870s that they began to kind of discover the Chino Lakes as a place to have fun. Um, and this also ties in to kind of what was going on in the United States at the time. Most people were still um, living in small villages and farming, and so they didn't really, they kind of work all the time, and they didn't really have um, free time as we kind of have today. Um, and so kind of what happened after the Civil War was the United States became more of an industrial nation. People started moving to cities. They had jobs where they had a set work schedule, and then after that they whatever they want with their spare time. And so they started to have leisure time. And Wapaka residents started to benefit from kind of this new form of uh, work when um, the railroad was built to Wapaka. So the first railroad that came to Wapaka was the Wisconsin Central Railroad. Um, it was later reorganized as the Sioux Route, and that's what a lot of people still remember it as today. Um, so it came to Wapaka in um, the early 1870s. And this picture here is actually a photograph of the first locomotive that came through Wapaka, um, and really through all the other towns along Wisconsin Central at the time. Um, so Wapaka residents really wanted the railroad. Um, and this was because once they had the railroad, the farmers could start selling their product, their the crops that they grew in faraway markets. And with that, they had more, they were able to kind of have a more, uh, kind of more of the work schedule that people in cities had. They were able to focus on one type of crop. They, were, they weren't focused on farming to survive. So they had a little of that burden released from them. And so kind of one fact that shows how much Opaca wanted the railroad was that the citizens of Opaca had a referendum and voted to purchase a bond that they then gave to the railroad to help construct it. So it was about uh, 50 grand, which was a lot of money uh, in the 19th century. Um, and so they were able to have the railroad. It came in in September 1871. There were big crowds um, to greet it. And this, and one other result that I don't think Wapaka residents at the time expected was that with the railroad, uh, tourists would start coming and wanting to stay in their uh, town and in the chain of lakes. So, but before we get there, um, so now that Wapaka residents had the railroad and they started having more free time, um, they started using the Chain of Lakes for recreation. During the 1870s, they began picnicking on the shores, they started boating and swimming in its water, uh, they began building cottages and docks and buying land. Um, Hank uh, Mamaru Wapaka built the first dock on the chain on Taylor Lake in, uh, we think, the late 1870s. He also purchased a steamboat up for the lakes and hired a pilot to give tours. 
And so really people in Wapaka started seeing the lakes uh, from the perspective of the boat. They started talking about it and it started um, uh, to spread along to other places as well. Um, this photo shows a steamboat on the Chain of Lakes that was called the Catamaran. Um, a man named Mr. Jenny um, was the operator of it. We don't quite uh, have his name because we only um, know about him through newspaper articles. Um, but yeah, this was a really big steamboat. Some of them were much smaller, but he actually had dances on the dock um, and uh, concerts as well. It was a very popular spot on the Chain of Lakes. And the original steamboats that toured the Chain of Lakes uh, moved very slowly, much slower than the, than the power boats that came later on. Um, but really, this gave passengers the time to really have a leisurely <coughs> evening or day to spend time with their friends and also to really view the Chain of Lakes and all of their beauty and have time to look at it. Very similar to how being on the Chico Cat is today. Uh, this photograph is from 1899. It shows um, Nettie Carpenter, who I believe is um, in the middle on the bottom row. Um, and she didn't write down which steamboat this was, um, but it's still is such a good, it just kind of shows uh, what, it, what a scene on a steamboat would look like in the past year. Um, so by 1880, uh, Wapaka residents were using the Channel Lakes for recreation. They kind of realized what the gem was, and they um, started, they wanted to uh, kind of capitalize that. They wanted people to come to Wapaka and help build up the city. Um, and so this is a man named Irving Ward. He was a lawyer of Wapaka. He is um, best known um, for constructing the electric trolley that was here in the early 20th century. He also operated the Grand View Hotel. Um, but one thing I discovered in my research was he started um, promoting tourism at the Chain of Lakes much earlier. Um, when he, he was kind of what was called a booster in the 19th century, he wrote about his town because he wanted people to come move there. He wanted them to start businesses, to bring their talent, and really build up the city of Opaca. And so he um, started writing, new, he wrote for a lot of different newspapers, um, starting from when I believe as early as 17. But kind of when he was in his early 20s, he started writing about Wapaka and the Chain of Lakes as a place to visit. One more time. Uh, so this is an article, the start of one that he wrote in the Chicago Inner Ocean in 1880. And uh, what is really interesting about this article, uh, he, he mostly describes Wapaka in it, but at the end he mentions the Chain of Lakes. And this is, um, he writes, but not to be compared with these little gems, he's talking about Mare and Shadow Lake, um, are the some, already somewhat famous Chain of Lakes, three and a one half miles from Opaka. This is unique because this is the first, the oldest historical document or article that I found that calls the Chain of Lakes the Chain of Lakes. So um, it definitely kind of shows that what, that's what Opaka residents were calling it, and that's kind of where the name stuck. It's really just um, a play off of Chain of Lakes. Um, kind of similar to things like um, the land of lakes butter, the land of lakes butter. Um, so with uh, Irving Lord and other people writing articles, the people in Wapaka realized they needed a hotel if they wanted people to come and stay. And so in 1881, a group of Wapaka businessmen, uh, they started building a summer house on a uh, Rainbow Lake, where kind of the veterans' home is today, it was an area called Greenwood Park. It was where a big picnicking spot. Um, and so, kind of partway after they finished building the summer house, they decided that they were going to open it as a hotel instead. And um, we really don't know exactly why they made this decision. I uh, think it was they kind of realized the need for it in on the Chamber Lakes and kind of went with it. Um, so this uh, lithograph uh, was in a kind of a book that promoted Northern Wisconsin in the 1880s. Um, but this is an image of the Greenwood Park Hotel. The hotel is kind of in the middle, but you can see a lot of different things going on. You can see they built separate cottages off of the hotel that they rented to people to stay in. Um, they, there's kind of some tents over here on a hill, so they might have let people camp here as well. They have the docks um, where steamboats can come, where people can go on the water. Um, and so the Green Hotel, um, by historical sources, it was pretty popular. The Wisconsin Central Railroad actually considered buying it at one time to promote the railroad service. Um, but for whatever reason, the hotel closed in 1884. Um, it was 
most likely just poor financial management, uh, or perhaps there was a decline and people wouldn't come to the lake, so we cannot be 100% sure. Um, but the Greenwood Park Hotel comes in a little later. Um, so this is another person who helped promote the Chain of Lakes as a tourist destination. Um, so he is uh, George Calkins. He was a Wapaka doctor, and in about 1800, in 1880, um, he had some health issues, and he decided um, that he was going to purchase a property on Sunset Lake, on the Chain of Lakes, to, and move his family there in the summers to relax. And actually, what he ended up dis uh, what ended up happening is he discovered mineral springs on his property, and he was a doctor. Um, he realized that this pure mineral water may have good health effects, and so he started prescribing it to some of his patients as an aid uh, for things like um, diabetes, indigestion, uh, a lot of nervousness. Even there's kind of a lot of interesting uh, symptoms. He said it would help cure. Um, and he actually had the water tested by a chemist as well um, to kind of prove that it had good natural properties. Um, and so he started a business bottling um, the water. Um, he started bottling and selling it across the country in 1885, branding it as medicinally. He called the business the Shield Heal Mineral Springs. Um, Shield Heal is a Hebrew word that means ask of God. And so this is actually um, an example of what one of the bottles that he used looked like. Um, it may be a water bottle, it may be a soda bottle, he also made soda as well. Um, but it's actually one that I was able to find on eBay a couple of years ago. But really, um, what I think is interesting about it is that it shows Shield Hill Springs, Wapaka, Wisconsin. Um, so it has Wapaka on it, and people who are sending this out as, and selling it as a medical aid, so this helped give the Chain of Lakes the appearance of a medical resort. So in the 19th century, people often traveled when they were sick to a different climate, especially if you lived in cities during the summer when it was hot and there was smoke and smog and such in the air. And so this kind of helped give have the image of like one of these places that you could go and that had a good, healthy atmosphere, good water, um, things like that. Uh, the business was pretty successful, but Calkins uh, died uh, suddenly in 1896, and the business uh, pretty much stopped there. So, going back to the Greenwood Park Hotel, so it stayed vacant for a couple years after it closed. But then in 1887, uh, the Grand Army of the Republic, a uh, Civil War Veterans Organization, they decided they wanted to start a retirement home for uh, retired Civil War veterans and their wives. Um, they're having trouble finding places to live. And so they wanted to build a home. They looked at a lot of different sites across Wisconsin. They liked um, the Chino Lakes, um, but really, what really sealed the deal was uh, Wapaka, the city of Wapaka uh, had another referendum. The citizens voted to actually purchase the Greenwood Park Hotel for uh, the Grand Army of the Republic so that they would bring the veterans home. Um, and the Veterans Home opened in fall of 1887. Um, the old Greenwood Park Hotel building, shown here, became uh, the original Martin Hall. I don't believe uh, the original one is still standing anymore. And so really, this picture, uh, another lithograph, shows the home um, in 1893. So in just six years, the Grand Army of the Republic really greatly expanded the Veterans Home. They had tons of different buildings uh, where people could live, or or there were recreation buildings, dining halls, hospitals as well. Um, there were cottages where the civil war veterans and their wives could live and kind of have their own space. Um, and so it really became very big. And what the Veterans Home helped do for the Chain of Lakes was it was also another form of advertising. Um, and so people came to the Veterans Home for a lot of different reasons. They may have had relatives or friends who were living there, so they visited them. Um, there were also local organizations um, and Grand Army chapters across um, Wisconsin actually paid to construct some of these cottages. So they would have a plaque on there that said it was built by them. So people from those organizations would visit to see uh, their work um, and also meet the people living there. And then there were also, um, What's interesting is that it was also a place where people could go who wanted to uh, pay their respects to Civil War veterans. Um, both, both the people who were currently living there, um, also the people buried in the cemetery. The cemetery
cemetery you can kind of see in the top right corner. Um, but they built that very early on and pretty much gave anyone who lived in the home, I believe, um, they were able to do the bury there for free if they so chose. Um, so another reason, uh, so a lot of Civil War regiments, the veterans of them, they built their own buildings there where their members could live. And so they also had reunions there. Um, so that was another way they brought people to the Chain Lakes. This photograph um, from the Wisconsin Historical Society shows um, members of the 21st Wisconsin Infantry, Infantry during the reunion they held in the 1890s. Um, so you can kind of see that I believe the veterans are all kind of on the ground level, and I believe their wives are up on the balcony there as well. Um, so the veterans' home was another thing that really it helped accelerate the success of the James Tourism industry and really kind of, I think, pushed it into what would become uh, the chain's kind of pick up heyday of tourism um, in some respects. So, um, from 1890 to 1915, the Chain of Lakes really became a very typical railroad uh, vacation town of the turn of the century. Uh, it's very similar to places like Lake Geneva or Green Lake um, back there, um, back in the early 20th century. But one unique aspect about the Chain of Lakes um, as a tourism, as a place to visit, was there were a lot of different things you could do there, a lot of different types of locations you could have. You could stay in fancy hotels, you could stay in more rustic hotels and cottages, uh, you could also attend religious meetings, and a lot more. So I'll kind of go into a couple different types examples of different places. Uh, so this photograph shows William and Elizabeth Smith. Um, they were a farm family who settled in the Chain Lakes, um, I believe in the 1850s or 60s. Um, and so they were pretty much just having a pretty standard farm life. And then tourists started coming and they asked, can we stay in your farmhouse? And so they turned their farmhouse into a lodging house, and they did this for many years, starting in the 1880s. Um, and so they started doing that. Um, they had four sons, and one of them was Fred Smith, who's shown on the bottom row in the middle. And Fred, uh, he came of age, and he decided that the, the tourism industry is a good thing to get involved in. So he built um, the Prince Mary Inn on Sunset Lake, kind of on the western edge, on the western shoreline. And um, so he opened it with his wife Minnie, um, and they had some success. His parents continued to house people in his, in their farmhouse, but then in 1897 the farmhouse actually um, burned down. They had a fire, and so they kind of turned this tragedy into. Um, Kind of something positive. So they built uh, the Loxley Lodge or Loxley Inn or Loxley Hall, and then it later became known as Loxley Lodge. Uh, so this was on uh, Brown Lakes, kind of North Shore. And so they um, they named it after a poem by Alfred uh, Lord Tennyson, uh, the English poet. And so they opened it to the public in 1898, and they had a lot of success. Uh, since they started uh, boarding tourists in their farmhouse, they also built a lot of cottages on their property that people could stay in as well, and then they would feed them at the house. And they continued that um, with uh, the Lark Single Lodge as well. So the people who stayed in either the Prince Mary Inn or Loxley Lodge um, were really, uh, they wanted to have, it was really a more rustic experience. Um, which, especially for city people, um, was a really kind of unique experience for them. Um, there was no running water in these hotels, no indoor plumbing or electricity. The rooms were very spartan. There wasn't a lot of organized activities for them to do. And it was mostly them making their own fun, socializing, fishing, boating, um, uh, and all those types of things. Um, this photo shows um, some tourists at Loxley Lodge in 1925. And I think it's really cool because it kind of shows you see someone drinking water straight from the water pump with like kind of her family or friends around her um, observing. So it's kind of like it's this novel experience that they may be having, especially if they live in cities. And of course, the water was also a huge thing as well. Um, there were piers by both hotels that are both on the water. Uh, the Smith family, they had boats, um, canoes that they let, the, let their guests use. They also had some steamboats as well that they used to give them tours. 
Um, and so this photo shows, I guess, that Locke's still alive in 1925. Um, she's on the canoe. Um, you can kind of see Brown Lake in the background there um, as well. And another thing that the Smiths did um, was they, they organized what I think are the first kind of structured uh, canoe trips down the Crystal River. They dropped off canoers at the mouth of the river at Log Lake in the morning, and then in the evening they would go to uh, Parfreyville and pick up the canoers there and take it back to the hotel. So on the other side of the lake, on Rainbow Lake, uh, visitors could have an entirely different experience. Uh, the Grand View Hotel was started by a pack of businessmen um, in 1894. It was built just south of the veterans' home. Um, they were kind of um, built it there to be close to the people who were coming to the veterans' home as well. And really, the Grand View was just uh, kind of a much more typical 19th century resort for kind of upper middle class and elite people. Um, and so the Wukak businesses, who, businessmen who founded it, uh, they hired a uh, professional out of town um, hotel proprietors to run it for the first six years. But then in 1901, uh, our friend Irving Lord uh, comes back. He actually purchased the Grand View and started operating it. So he made a lot of changes to it. Um, he added, uh, he modernized it. He added electricity and more plumbing. Um, he also developed a lot more recreation facilities. He built a bathhouse, a baseball field, um, a couple of extra buildings. And so he really modernized it. And so this is an example of the pamphlets that he sent out to people who were interested in vacation there. And uh, kind of in it, you can see um, what kind of marketing strategy he was using. He calls it an ideal family resort. He really wanted to appeal, uh, make it an experience for all the families. Every member of the family had something to do. Um, and so compared to the Smith's Hotel, staying at the Grand View was a whole different experience. You had to wear, you had to wear, um, men had to wear a suit and tie and for dinner, women had to, you had to dress up in formal clothing. Children weren't allowed in the dining room at all. They had a separate dining room that they had with servants as well. And so the Grand View had a team of chefs. They had really extravagant meals, as this picture shows. This is a 4th of July dinner in 1899. Um, and also, the Grand View also offered a lot of different amenities that the Smith's hotels didn't have. Uh, the rooms were cleaned every day. Staffs, you could ring a bell and staff would bring a hot water if you wanted to take a bath. Um, there were organized dances and musical entertainment. There were fishing guides that you could hire for a day to take you out and show you the best spots to fish. There was a great cream shop and a cigar shop right by the water. Um, and so this picture shows the staff at the Grand View in 19, around 1905. It's a very big team. Um, the man in the middle holding the baby was Irving Lord's brother, who ran the hotel for a couple of years. <coughs> yeah, so another type of experience people have was uh, at Camp Cl uh, Claycorn on Columbia Lake. So uh, Camp Claycorn was founded by an organization called the Wisconsin Good Templars in 1897. The Good Templars were a religious group that advocated for um, temperance, which was basically they wanted people to be more moderate with their consumption of alcohol. They wanted to outlaw alcohol sales and consumption in certain places. Um, and so they originally started the camp uh, to hold what they called their camp annual assemblies. These were uh, these were event, two week events usually where their members from all over the state and sometimes other parts of the country could come and they could take classes on the temperance movement. They could learn uh, kind of of uh, what the current thought was, what current strategy was. But these events were much more than just kind of an educational experience. They were religious services, entertainment, recreational activities. They had prominent speakers come. Um, and so it really appealed to a group of people who didn't just want to spend their uh, vacation relaxing. They wanted to be more productive. They wanted to learn. They wanted to um, experience good music, um, kind of uh, focus on their religious. Uh, religion as well. Um, and so really for the first couple of years, the camp Clay Coin was mostly a tent camp. So this postcard shows a row of tents there. Um, people would stay in them for the two weeks. Um, 
But really, Camp Claythorne grew pretty quickly. Um, this uh, shows uh, some of the first buildings that were built, where on the left is the dining hall, which they offered dinner to the campers as well as lunch on Sundays. People from the community could come. On the right in this picture, you um, can see the camp store. They sold pretty much everything people camping needed, from camping supplies to produce um, to, um, they also sold, um, they would later on sell soda as well, and ice cream as well. And so the Camp Clay Corn Assemblies were more than just for the members who came to the assembly. They opened it up to the community, anyone staying on the lakes or the back could come. Um, especially for their Sunday services. I believe it was a big event. So Camp Claycorn changed pretty, uh, as the 20th century grew on, uh, the Good Templars had it gradually, they didn't have as big of a role as time went on. And this was partially because temperance became less of a popular cause. Um, after Prohibition ended, people weren't as keen on it. Um, and so the last uh, Good Templar Assembly happened in uh, the late 1940s. Um, and really what kind of happened to Camp Claycorn was the people who had built cottages there became kind of the main owners. It became mostly a cottage community um, for people, uh, for the people who owned the cottages to come and stay during the summer. Um, and so it really changed, and it's still kind of on a very similar model today. A lot of the cottages there are still original, I believe, as well. So, um, with people uh, coming to the Chain of Lakes much more, uh, much more often than they had in the past, one issue that came up was the railroad station was in Wakaka, but the Chain of Lakes were about three miles away by a horse, uh, by a horse and buggy that just came up to an hour. Um, so, what happened was um, Irving Lord, again, comes into the picture, he and um, a business partner, they um, owned the Wakaka Electrical Companies, the people who provided electricity to Wakaka for the first time. They got permission from the city of Wakaka to build an electric trolley that would take people from um, right at the train station over to the Chain of Lakes um, at the Grandview Hotel and uh, Veterans Home. And so they okay, started um, construction in 1899. This is a picture showing the construction um, uh, taking place. They laid, the line was about 4.5 4 miles long. It started at the uh, Wapaka Depot, um, which is still in its current location that the Historical Society runs. It would start there, it would go through downtown Wapaka, and then it went west down Fulton Street, and then southward along County QQ, and stopped um, right at, there was a stop at the Veterans Home, and then there was a stop at the Grandview Hotel. And then the first trolley ran on July 4th, 1899. So what the trolley really did was it provided a very easy means for people to both travel between the lakes and Wapaka, if they were Wapaka residents, but also to bring uh, tourists from the train station over to the lakes. And it really created quite a uh, very smooth, it really integrated the two communities and made it very easy to go between. Um, it was important also in the winter be uh, because it allowed people to still get to the veterans' home safely without having to go out into the cold, they heated cars. Um, and also to deliver the mail to the veterans' home in the winter. Um, so this photograph here shows um, one of the trolley cars. Um, it had two employees, one was the motor man and one was um, the conductor. Um, they were mostly with Packer residents, so these are two of them here. I believe this picture, it's either um, right by the veterans' home or it's um, in downtown Packer. Not country percent sure. So now that people can get to the lakes easier, one last kind of piece in this whole infrastructure was what was called the electric dock. So Irving Lord built this as well. And it wasn't, it was called the electric dock because this is where people who came to the lakes on the trolleys uh, would go and wait for a boat. If they were staying somewhere else on the lake besides the Grand View, they could get picked up there. The tour boats um, kind of ferried people. So it really created such a very seamless infrastructure between Wapaka pretty much get anywhere, and it was very um, useful for people before the age of automobiles. So what happened in um, 1915 uh, was the chain, of, the chain of lakes started to change, the tourism industry started to change, um, and one of the main changes that happened was 
more and more tourists started to prefer to stay in cottages as opposed to the hotels or inns. Um, and so this is really, this trend continued throughout the 20th century. It's what has made the Chain of Lakes really a commute, uh, really mostly a community of like vacation homes and cottages. Um, and that's really the main, really the main places that you can stay there today. There are traditional hotels right on the lake and many more. And the reason for this was because of the invention of the automobile. So during the 1910s, automobiles became much cheaper and easier to produce because of Henry Ford's assembly line and other innovations. And so more, pretty much by between 1910 and 1920, by the end of the decade, people were mostly driving cars. Like motor car ship shot up like crazy. And so with the cars, tourists didn't need to take the railroad and the electric trolley anymore. They could just drive up to their cottage and go between Wapaka and the Chingle Lakes at ease. Um, so this photograph shows a Ford Model T that one family um, took to take to the Chingle Lakes in 1915. They stayed on Columbia Lake. Um, this is actually their cottage that they stayed at. Um, so there are a lot of reasons that cottages were more preferable to stay in. Um, they were much more private than hotels. They allowed families to spend much more close time together, socializing with each other instead of other guests at different activities. Um, cottages were much more informal. You didn't need to dress up to go to dinner. Um, and also, they were, you were really right up against nature. You weren't staying on a manicured hotel property. You were kind of right in, right in the woods, right along the shore. And so this picture is fun because it shows the man looks to be either holding or feeding a pheasant, um, so right up against nature. And then another reason um, cottages really took over was because of the family memories that people made there. Um, people, people who, uh, who bought cottages in the early 20th century often kept them up into the present day in some cases. Uh, this is Newdale Cottage on uh, Rainbow Lake, and it's one example. It was founded by a couple, or was purchased by a couple in 1901. They started taking their children there, and their children started taking their children there, and it became a family tradition for them. And you really see examples of this all over the chain of lakes. Um, the book that the Chain Association put out in uh, 2009 is called Our Cottages, Our Memories, and that includes just so many stories about cottages on the chain of lake and what they meant to so many families. Um, and so in the book, I have I don't, it would be almost impossible to cover every single cottage, so I kind of just pick ones based on photos that I found to talk about. Um, and I'm not going to be able to talk about a lot of those tonight. Um, but I chose a couple of examples I wanted to talk about because of the people who own them. So Edward Brown was one of them. Edward Brown was a Wapaka lawyer and also um, a Wisconsin state senator in the U.S. Uh, House, of, and he also served in the U.S. House of Representatives as well. So in 1900, he purchased most of Macrossan, Macrossan Lake's northern shore and built his own cottage on summertime, which is showed up here. Um, he built that in about 1903, um, I'm pretty sure. And so he, uh, he owned all the northern shore, and so what he did was he built cottages uh, for different members of his family. This uh, shows uh, his pretty much most of his um, immediate family, uh, his wife, his four children, and some grandchildren, and also a daughter-in-law, um, we're pretty sure, or another relative. Um, and so he actually built, he was a big environmentalist, he built a park um, next to his cottage, and really he helped preserve that whole area. And I think he's to think that the northern shore of the lake is still so heavily wooded. Um, but so he also built cottages. He built, what's interesting is he built two cottages um, for his two daughters, who were both still teenagers at the time when he built them. Um, so kind of an interesting gift um, by today's standards. Um, but then they then inherited them and used them when they were older as, older as adults with their family as well. Um, so Edward Brown was pretty prominent in Wapaka, but um, perhaps the most famous cottage dweller on the lakes was Miss Esther Williams. Uh, so Esther Williams was, um, if you know her, she was a competitive swimmer who became a movie star um, because of the aqua musicals she performed in. 
Um, and so she, um, there are a lot of newspaper accounts and a lot of um, eyewitness accounts of people who lived in the chain um, back when she was around um, that she vacationed on the lakes. And there's actually credibility to this. Um, her second husband um, was Ben Gage, and he actually owned um, the smallest island on the chain of lakes in uh, Rainbow Lake. Um, it was originally called Crescent Lake. Um, so he owned a cottage there, and really, um, him and Esther Williams visited there a couple times during their marriage, which lasted from 1945 um, to 1959. Um, and it's kind of fun, the newspaper articles I found talking about her visits show that she was like at a train station or uh, some public place, and she had big sunglasses on, she was trying to hide her identity, but people still recognized her anyway. Um, so you see a lot of those articles. And then also, people remember uh, her swimming on the Channel Lakes as well. Um, and so her and Gage owned the, home, um, owned the cottage until about 1955. What happened in 1950 was the cottage burned down, um, so they weren't able to use it as much. Uh, they sold it to um, Hobart Edmonds of Edmonds Dock um, fame. Um, and that now, today, it's owned by uh, Camp Conway. But the island is still called and known by many as Esther Williams Islands so because of her stance. Um, so now that cottages were becoming much more popular with people coming by automobile, um, another part that changed were the attractions and the hotels that people stayed at when they did the visit. Um, the automobile tours um, were a very different generation of travelers. They, wanted hotels that went rented rooms by the night instead of by the week. They wanted to easily drive up their car to the places they stayed. And so um, they also wanted things that were easy to access to, um, like restaurants and attractions that were easy to access by the roads. And so the chain locals, of course, met their demand. So um, one, of, like, the, one of the first automobile hotels on the chain of lakes uh, was the Pines Inn across the lake. Um, it was founded by Minnie Smith in 1916. Minnie Smith owned the Prince Mary with her husband. Um, what happened was her and her husband actually got a divorce and they sold the Prince Mary Inn and then they bought, she bought a cottage on the Crossing Lake and turned that into a hotel. So she started with just one cottage, which is kind of in the left in this picture, um, but then she had a lot of success. She started this in 1916, and then by the 1920s, she was able to build a big lodge with guest rooms, also a dining hall. Um, and she ran it until her death in 1943, and after that, her son took over. Um, so uh, this is a picture of the dining hall that was at the Pines Inn. Um, the dining hall was right up, you could easily access it from the parking lot. It was mainly where guests stayed, but a lot of community members and people on the chain used it for presentations, meetings, weddings as well. And um, this helped to popularize it. It may have also offered dining service to the community. I haven't quite found anything to verify that. Um, but yeah, and so the Pines Inn, um, it had a lot of guest rooms that people could stay in. It had uh, lounge area that had direct water access. Um, this photo shows it, I believe, in the 19, uh, 1950s or 60s. Um, but yeah, so the Pines Inn still operates today. Uh, my family has stayed there up to that point. Um, it, it looks a little different these days. Um, so what happened in 1967 was the current owners, the Kyles, um, they converted the lodge and the dining hall, which were right next to each other, they converted them into four separate units that people could rent out. So it was a much more of a cottage layout. Um, this kind of show was in the 60s. Um, they really, they changed the cottages because that's what, people, they changed to more of a cottage model because that's what tourists wanted at the time. So really by the 60s, our uh, cottages were, had pretty much taken over. Another big attraction um, that was built for automobile tourists um, was the Indian Crossing Casino. Um, so William Arnold, who was a Chicago bus businessman, built the casino in 1925 um, as a dance pavilion. Casino today, we mostly think of gambling places, but it was in, as a historical word, it, is, um, it mostly refers to any type of entertainment venue. It was used 
pretty uh, broadly. Um, and so uh, this is a picture of the casino in its early years. You can see it hasn't changed very much. It still, still had the bright orange colors when it was built. Um, and it was really, it was a place where people who were staying on the chain or lived in the area were able to go and they were able to dance on weekends and some weeknights. Uh, they had big bands come and play and people could dance. They had different types of theme nights and things like that. They had a lot of, uh, uh, some of the famous people who uh, performed there in the early years. Uh, Exactly. Louis Armstrong played there as a jazz musician um, in the 1930s and 40s. Um, so yeah, in its early years, the casino, they had a huge parking lot on its opening day. Um, over between 5,000 and 10,000 people visited. Um, the county, what's now County Highway Q was completely, um, the traffic was pretty much blocking the entire road down past the bridge. Um, so it was a very popular place early on. And it continued throughout the 30s and 40s. They, had, they still had the big bands. When the 1950s and 60s came around, it was much more um, um, different bands of the day. So people like the Beach Boys played there, the Everly Brothers, they raced the casino stage. Um, some older or some later owners of the casino built, um, they actually built a small restaurant up on the side called the Sugar Bowl. Um, that is now kind of Diggy Dock, Diggy Stock's offices today. They also have an arcade as well. Um, so yeah, really cars it became, it stayed around, it was built for cars, and it's still the main way that people use it today. And it's really, the car culture is still very prominent on the lakes. So there were also, um, besides um, the Indian Crossing Casino, there were also roadside attractions. So. Um, Roadside attractions appeared a lot during the automobile days. Uh, things like Wall Drug Store and like, things like the world's largest ball of yarn are kind of examples of one. On the Chain of Lakes, the biggest roadside attraction was uh, Whispering Pines Park. So Whispering Pines Park started uh, when a couple who lived in Chicago by the name of Christ and Emma Hildegard, they retired um, from their milk business um, Price was only 42, but he had heart problems and needed a less stressful lifestyle. So they bought property on uh, Marlow Lake, and with all of his free time, Price um, was a big gardener, and so he built um, he built a few he landscape community. They built a cottage. They had a, he built a lot of replicas. So um, this picture shows a windmill that was by kind of a cottage. He also built bird houses that looked like castles and so many different types of buildings. He gathered together a garden of rocks that were shaped like things like bald eagle and famous people. Um, and so yeah, they had this property and then they started allowing tourists to visit in 1932. And they called their property Whispering Pines Park um, because of all the pine trees that were on the property. And so really, by the summer of 1936, they had 13,000 people visiting every year to see the, uh, both the park and also all of the different attractions and displays. Um, by 1939, they had over 20,000 people visiting. And so the popularity led the Hildegards to make it into a uh, really, they added a lot of different amenities. They built refreshment stands. Uh, this is one uh, shown here on the left. They built picnic groves, gift shops, a museum. Uh, they continued making up the fun attractions, uh, similar to like the bird houses and the rock garden. Uh, this photo um, shows uh, the gift shop at um, Whispering Pines in the 1950s. By then, they were having up to 80,000 people visiting every summer. Um, this photo actually shows uh, Christ at the register. And um, what is kind of a fun fact is they had a can of peanuts behind the desk because um, to feed stray squirrels and chipmunks. And so in this picture, uh, it's kind of hard to see if you kind of see there's a squirrel on top of the cash register. Um, so yeah, kind of a fun little quirk to it. Um, this picture is actually in the Wisconsin Historical Society's collection, and I was really excited to find it. And so the attractions at the attractions and displays at Whispering Pines were really pure Americana. Like, um, they were cheesy as a lot of tourist attractions were, but they were witty and fun. Um, 
two shown here. On the left is a rock that's shaped like George Washington. Uh, you can kind of see it if you look at it the right way. There also, uh, on the right, is uh, what he called the Fountain of Youth, so a fun display. Another one that we don't have a picture of was, it was like a, a donation box um, that had uh, stuffed squirrels playing cards on it. So there were just all these fun little things in it that tourists just love. There's a museum there as well with a lot of antiques. Um, so, um, so Whispering Pines closed um, after Christ and Emma died in the 1960s and 70s. It was then sold to the state of Wisconsin, who made the decision, a very controversial one, to basically remove the displays and buildings and return it back to like its state of nature. Um, it was, uh, I know a lot of people still fond of the river and wish it was still uh, as it was back then. Uh, but now it's part of Park and Creek State Park. So I'm kind of reaching the end of the presentation. Uh, but so the last chapter of the book uh, focuses on really what I think is the one thing about the chain of lakes that hasn't really changed. People still come to the lakes because they want to be on the water. They want to swim, they want to boat, um, they want to um, fish and all these other different types of things. And so um, really the main thing that's changed, tourists in the 1800s came to the lakes for the same things. And the only thing that's changed is the boats that they used became more advanced, fishing technology changed, clothing and swimsuits changed. And so this chapter is one of the longest ones in the book. It has a lot of fun pictures. Um, definitely recommend taking a look at it. Um, but for the sake of time, I'm only gonna focus on um, one family who owned a boat livery at the Chain Lakes um, over a couple generations. And this family is um, the Nelson family. Um, so steamboats were really popular um, in the early 20th century. Um, and so one family moved to the Chain of Lakes in, in uh, about, uh, around the turn of the century. Um, it was a man named Charles Marion and his uh, wife and uh, stepdaughter, um, Bessie. And so he bought um, a steamboat called the Lady of the Lake, and he started giving tours on the chain. And he actually recruited um, his stepdaughter, Bessie, uh, who was only about, um, I believe, 12 years old when she started working with him. She actually steered the boat while he was at the back with, by the steam engine shoveling in coal and the wood to keep the boat going. And a, and a lot of old postcards of the ladies laying in the lake, you can see uh, Bessie at the helm um, um, steering. Um, and so they had a very successful business. Um, they purchased more steamboats. They also started portraying, purchasing motor boats as well. And so what happened um, in 1915, Charles died, and then um, his stepdaughter Bessie inherited the business. And she um, really, she, was a, she grew up with um, giving tours, and she um, really just helped the business uh, blossom. She actually met in, uh, she met in uh, about uh, late 1910, she met a man named Edward Nelson while she was giving a tour among the boats. They married in 1919, and they, um, expanded the business quite substantially. They rebanded it as Nelson's Boat Line. Um, originally it was called like Chain Lakes um, Steamer Cottage Company. But so they changed it to the Nelson name. And they really just expanded the business. They purchased canoes that they rented out. They purchased steamboats and power boats or motor boats and power boats as they became, um, as they released more passenger models and individual ones. And they built um, on on kind of their main base of operations on Rainbow Lake, they built, um, uh, besides boats, they built a, a swim beach, a picnic grove, a bathhouse, they built a small shop that sold ice cream and soda, a kind of old-fashioned soda parlor, and really became a big spot on the chain of lakes for many years. Um, and so this, um, you can see uh, there, this shows the business around 19, uh, the mid-1930s, um, and actually, if, um, most of it is kind of gone, but the boathouse here on the far right was actually still on the Chain of Lakes for many years. You may recognize it. There was this uh, yellow boathouse on the Bayer Rainbow Lake. Um, and uh, I took this picture a couple of years ago. I think it's since then been um, taken down, unfortunately. Uh, but it was still uh, kind of a part of the Chain of Lakes history um, for many, many years.
Pinto, um, Bessie and um, Edward's only daughter, only child, um, Benny Nelson. She was a part of the family business, as was the tradition in their family. She actually gave tours on an um, early Chris Craft boat. This is a picture of her um, with it. Um, so as power boats became um, more popular in the 1920s and 30s. And so she um, was part of the business as well. Um, so Edward Nelson died in 1939, and then Bessie, uh, his wife, sold the business um, in 1947. It survived for a couple years um, under the name um, Clipper Boat Line, um, but then it um, kind of faded out um, as the services became less, um, or as other businesses came about. And, um, and yeah, so the Nelson family, um, their descendants are still on the chain of lakes today. They, they only still run the cottage portion of the original business, um, but they're still around and they actually you know, share more photos with people in the book. So one last story I'm going to tell to kind of round things out. Um, I'm going to tell this story because I think it's interesting because it really brings the Chain of Lakes um, history of like boats really full circle, and that's the story of the Chief Opeka. So um, the Chief Opeka uh, was, the origin of it was um, a man named Joe Leanne, um, who owned Dayton's Dock at the time in the 70s. Um, he bought an old boat called the Chief Oshkosh, um, with his employee, um, Pat Egan. And so the Chief Oshkosh was built in 1963 by the um, Chief Oshkosh Brewing Company. They, it's kind of a uh, for their anniversary. Um, they used to kind of, kind of deliver beer on um, Lake Poyden and um, Lake Mutamore, um, kind of in that area. They only used it for about two years, and then it went through a series of different owners who used it for different things. And then it eventually broke down and was docked on Lake Mutamore. So when uh, Jolian bought it, um, this is basically what it looked like. It was kind of in rough shape. Um, and so they bought it, and then they actually had to, they wanted to have it ready um, for the, they bought it in the winter. They wanted to have it ready um, by the spring. And so they actually had to go to Lake Utamore and had to actually saw the boat out of the ice if it was frozen in there. So they had to saw it out. Um, and then they had to disassemble it and drive it to a half in pieces. And uh, in the top left there, you can kind of see what it looked like as they brought it to the chain. Um, definitely can't imagine seeing that on the road today. Um, but a white boat, you can kind of see it was just the base. So they brought it to Dean's Dock, um, they put it on the land, and then they refurbished it up to kind of what it looks like today. Um, and these photos are from, uh, I got them from uh, Jolian's personal collection. Um, they're just very cool. I'm very grateful that you shared them. Because I've definitely never seen them. Um, so they rebuilt the boat, they recrested it, the uh, Chief Opaca, and it hit the waters of the chain in summer uh, of 1974. Um, it initially left from Dingstock, uh, when Dingstock was still located where Becker's Marina is today, um, so it was still on the other side of the um, Indian Crossing Bridge. Um, and yeah, and then the following year, 1975, um, they purchased um, at the old Edmunds Dock building at Taylor Lake, in the Claremont Harbor, which um, is still running today. Um, and so I think it's, um, like I said, it kind of brings the Chain of Lakes history full circle. Um, people in the early 19th century liked steamboats. If they died out, then um, uh, they brought it back. Um, so the, chain, the Chief Opaca the steamboat still traverses the chain's waters today, much like the steamboats of the 19th century. Um, only difference is it uses a diesel engine instead of a steam engine, which is much more um, effective. And 